Hello and welcome to Feedback for the week of May 26, 2010, in case you didn't know what year it was. Um, I'm Adam Sessler, joined by Patrick Klepek, Abby Happy, and Sterling McGarvey. Uh, first off, most important, Patrick, mm. Lost is over. How are you doing? Uh, well, I'm actually going to be looking for Lost actors passing by our studio as we record. Because so apparently it, they have nothing else to do now. Yeah, except to they're try completely and find lost. Me. Yeah, they, well, they're trying to find me, so uh, I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm, I'm happy. It concluded well. So All right. I, I had to deal with no more regular Law & Order. There's now That's four true. more iterations out there. but um, okay. It Sam got, Watterson is out of a job now. Yeah, he was he was losing that job on air uh, <laughs> over the past couple of seasons. So uh, yes, there's just both losses for 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 the two of us. Don't but forget twenty four. Twenty four. That's right. Were you a twenty four watcher? I was up until midway through season three, and then Patrick watched way more than me. Yep, was, right. didn't miss anything. Yeah, that's top kind chef of a... masters will be over soon. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but then it will return next year with, uh, in all likelihood, which which is a good thing. Um, so let's get to some gaming news. This is not about loss, even though I think many people out there believe it is. And this yes. is Insomniac is the next in line of numerous game companies saying that they're you know having these brand new deals with a big publisher. Yeah, they uh, they're they're the next ones up. Uh, they they signed a deal with EA Partners, same de- uh, same company or side company or partner company or however you want to call it, Division of Electronic Arts uh, that Respawn did for their their deal. Uh, very similar deal, actually, um, to produce a new franchise that will take them uh, to the PS3 and to the 360. Uh, the now, one- now while, while you do say franchise, this is a deal that seems to be only for one game. It's, it's, one, it's one game. Um, uh, Ted Price said that this, this CEO of Insomniac, Ted Price, said reflect how they handled their relationship with Sony. So, you know, they... Always, they kind of took it game to game, uh, and then just sort of evaluate where they could go from here. Because you know, you it's very easy to consider Insomniac a Sony owned company, even yes. though they're not. Right. But like, mm-hmm. it you wouldn't be you know remiss for thinking that. But now, they, no, just just clarify, Naughty Dog is a Sony owned company. Yes. I think that's where a lot of the confusion comes yeah. from. So even though Insomniac is not owned by Sony, their two main properties are owned by Sony. So Resistance, Gratchet and Clank are not going anywhere. You know, right. regardless of in the future that somehow Insomniac didn't work on them. Those are Sony properties as they're staying on the PlayStation 3. But yeah, this is for one deal. But uh, several times when I was talking to EA and Insomniac, EA was very persistent in that we expect to do a really good job. And, you know, er- they said specifically earn the earn right the, yeah. to work with Insomniac. So on future EA projects. was trying to make the case that they would impress Ted and David Algeyer and all those wonderful people over there that they would want to continue working with them on this franchise. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I love the sound of that. And congratulations to Evan Insomniac for getting that sound bite. Um, and it's the Burbank studio, not yes, the North Carolina, Carolina one. That's his name. At first, we thought it might have been we that were all, one. There's this yeah. mysterious project somewhere in the wilds of North Carolina, but that is still... We don't know who really has that no. game, it sounds like. No, we don't. We don't know who has that. It, it, no one might have that. There's really nothing stopping uh, Insomniac from signing oh, you know, a whole other contract with another publisher to sort of... Majesco. Try, yeah. Majesco. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was oh. always under the understanding that a lot of the tech and tools also were being innovated in the North Carolina studio. Because yes. I know they announced they were opening it, what was that, um, two years ago? I think it was uh, GDC 08. It was, it, was, it was sometime yeah, a, yes, a it while was. ago. It was yeah. GDC 08. GDC 08, and they basically kind of, in layman's terms, said, we know people have been complaining how hard it is to make games on this. Here's a bunch of the tools that we use to optimize this stuff. So, I mean, there's a chance that they could be doing a lot of their innovation out of that studio. Um, now... What is their relationship with Sony? I mean, have they said we're making games for Sony? Yeah, they they have outright said they are going to be producing PlayStation Three exclusive games going forward. Which you know, Resistance Three has already been leaked in a in a in a movie billboard poster uh, for that movie. I think it was Battle of Los Angeles or whatever it is. So clearly, you know, we're probably getting Resistance Three, and then the idea that you know. Even though Ratchet and Clank could have gone out on a really nice note with a crack in time, like my guess is we're going to see another Ratchet and Clank. But as far as how far that goes, we don't really know. But certainly they're going to be working with Sony for like a number of years to come. Now, one of the things I think has always impressed all of us about Insomniac is that they have a game coming out every year. I mean, they are Sony's workhorse. And they're, they're always at a very, very high level of quality. I mean, are we going to see the same level of output? I mean, is, is, is this the, did you get any sense what the cycle is going to be like, both with EA and Sony? One of the, the smaller announcements that didn't get as much press, but that you know, Ted brought up, was that in addition to the fact that they're announcing this new you know, franchise, new game, whatever, whatever you want to call it, they are changing their dev cycle. And they're, we, essentially, Insomniac's cycle right now is a two-year cycle, at least with the PS3. It used to be annual with the PS2, and now it's biannual with PS3 swapping franchises. We get a Ratchet one year, a Resistance another year. 
And, and I think, you know, it's it's a pretty common critique that Resistance 2 was really not up to snuff for Insomniac's sort of bar of quality. And that's something they've admitted as much, which is why we got pretty much no downloadable content for that game yes. after its release. Right. Well, it's also, I mean, it's still not the biggest studio on Earth. You would think it's like, you know, something the size of... I don't know something in Canada, but it's you know it's it, it's it's not that it's not big. Like, no, it's not like a Ubisoft studio who can throw like three hundred team members yeah. at a game. Like they they are very conservative. Given so you said like as big as something in Canada, and I'm I like just, what? Like I a bear? Blanked, <laughs> I blanked on every single major city in Canada all at the same time. Yeah. And I just went I for just something said, in Canada. I just had Canadian Tourette. <laughs> <laughs> eh. And exactly. <laughs> and, so, back to Insomniac. Yes, and Please. so so it's, <laughs> what, you know whatever they're working on now, we, we you know we can probably you know pretty pretty easily hypothetically say they're working on you know a new Ratchet and a new Resistance. These games w- will fall under this new dev cycle. So they they've been they're getting more than two years. Um, is this leading credence that we might not see anything from Insomniac at E three? Possibly, we maybe won't see anything if we don't see a game from them this year. That's that's big for them because they released a game for year for the past four years. When yeah. does, does anyone know when Battle for Los Angeles, shot on location in Louisiana, um, is coming out? It's that next, might be. It's, oh, I've been following that one so closely. <laughs> I'm glad you asked. It's, no. ne- it's next spring. Next spring. I mean, I think right there, if it has the Resistance Three Three billboard, I mean, if we were to surmise anything, that it may not necessarily be a, a, a game coming out this year. Um, l- let's read what Wasman says. Uh, Wasman twenty three. Excuse me. Uh, I'm specific. not sure what to think of this. Insomniac is my all-time favorite developer, and I love everything they've done thus far, so I'm a little hesitant to change. They are one of those developers who really makes the PS3 shine, and I don't want their newer existing IPs to suffer by going multi-platform. That being said, I'm glad they partnered with EA and will retain IP rights, and I guess it might give them a bigger budget. Only time will tell. I think that's what it comes down to, is that this EA Partners program is looking very attractive to everyone, and just like Respawn, they own this. So, I mean... Theoretically, if they picked something that I think is as marketable as like a Ratchet and Clank, something that has a very broad based appeal, I mean that's that's really good for them. Yeah, I mean, they, and they said, you know, Ted, just like you know, Bungie told me and Respawn told me was that the IP require like ownership was a requirement. That wasn't like, well, I don't know, we'll see how that goes. Like they would have not signed with anyone unless they got control of the IP, and they're they're again one of these like maybe like ten to fifteen studios that can demand that, but it's. It's really cool to see EA sort of lining lining this up, and I feel like we're getting into another situation where we've got EA doing all these really cool things. I just hope it pays off for them financially. I know, yeah. right. I know. Yeah. That's always been one of their big problems. I've always thought that like EA Partners was such a brilliant idea. Also, I feel like clarifying because there's a lot of people out there that think, "Oh my God, EA bought Insomniac." No, or exactly, and that's what we're trying and to like, lay to rest. Yeah, here. we need to like clarify. So basically, like. BioWare, owned by EA. Uh, the studios that you're hearing about, EA Partners, is a deal where they do the heavy lifting on the marketing and the distribution, but the developer retains all the rights. Sure, like Left 4 Dead. Yeah. Or like, uh, Rock Band. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What Valve or what People Can Fly are doing with um, Bulletstorm. With, with Bulletstorm. Yep. Exactly. Um, it's a really cool program. I think it's a fantastic and program. You know I, I think that we're going to start seeing, I mean, we know Activision has moved in that direction. I said it. I said Activision. There we go. Um, is, is going in that direction with Bungie. Ding. I do not think that it's just me, those two publishers <laughs> that are you know not who, who are not thinking about having programs like this. I mean, there are other studios out there that would greatly benefit from having this type of a deal. And I think it's it's good for creativity. And when it works, I think it's going to work better than just having like a corporate owned game that just happened to sell really well for you know one quarter. Yeah, I, it sounds like a win for EA and it's a win for Insomniac. And you know is. I haven't liked the Resistance franchise as, as much as, as some others have, so I'm just excited to see Insomniac do a new franchise. Like I think that's just really, really yeah. cool to yeah. see. It's a, it's, a, it's a good studio, and yeah, the more they can do, the happier I am. Yeah. Um, so uh, now speaking of loss, uh, two people at Microsoft look like that they are not there anymore, though I have a feeling that they're going to do just fine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> Rob, Robbie, ba- Robbie Bach, who has been essentially leading all of Microsoft's ad entertainment and devices, so that's like Zoom and Windows phones and Xbox. Um, he, he was more in charge of Xbox for a long time. Yeah, for, then, for, for quite some time. He was one of the top names, you know, back in the Seamus days. Uh, yeah, you know. and, then, and then promoted to the head of all of entertainment. Uh, him and Jay Allard, who used to be the face of Xbox during the early days and the early 360 days, and was essentially one of the biggest evangelists of that whole project when it got started, uh, they both have decided to leave. Uh, Robbie, it sounds like, um, you know, he's just, he's been there for 22 years. Uh, 
he, he said he wants to retire. And <laughs> not. Like that, that's yeah. a long time. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a long exactly. Get out. And, 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 and let, let me point out the, the way I just said it made it sound like that they were forced out. We don't, you know, what, it, what they are saying publicly right now is that hey, you know, it's been a long time, time to go somewhere Every, else. Everything, every, everything we're hearing is it sounds like it's it's a choice on both their parts. You know, with Robbie, it sounds like he's been there for twenty two years. He's probably got a <laughs> load of money and he wants to go do. He says he yeah. wants to do nonprofit work. So and he says he wants to work with the boys and girls clubs. Yes, which yeah. is I That's mean cool. it's very hard yeah. to find fault with that. So yeah, bravo to you, Robbie Bach. Dude, Jay Allard is a little more interesting in that uh, the, the the rumor was for the longest time he was heading up because uh, he would sort of move from like sort of cool project to cool project in at Microsoft for as, as cool as Microsoft projects can be. <laughs> and, <laughs> and and he was supposedly heading up the Courier project. It was Microsoft's really ambitious. Uh, like foldable tablet device, and a couple of weeks ago, Microsoft confirmed they weren't working on that anymore. And so it sounded like, as a result of that going kind of going sour, you know, Jay said, "Well, I've been here a long ass time too. I'm I'm going to get out too." Now, uh, the New York Times even did use the phrase "shake up," yeah, as if you know that. And I believe in the, in the lead sentence of their piece on this, they kind of cited that Robert, you know, that the 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 Balmer was making some decisions there. So that's why I, I kind of led to the fact that maybe there is. Decision making on, on on both sides. I mean, is there any indication that there might be moving in a new direction that they're trying to bring in kind of new talent into uh, Xbox? I mean, I don't know if it's about bringing new talent as much as if you look at you know Natal is supposed to launch this fall. You know, we're at right this fall. We should be getting a new console, and we're not. Like we you know messed up the cycle, and Microsoft's doing Natal as a way of rebranding, starting and launching a new console. So it makes sense so that like people, if they're going to commit to Project Natal and clearly whatever is after that. They're committing to like another three to five years yeah. in charge of these divisions. And maybe, you know, people don't want to do that. Like they either want to be in it, you know, full on or just say, hey, I'm going to move on and give it to some new people. And that's not really that shocking. I, think. I mean, on, I mean, on that note, I mean, there, I keep hearing, hey, are we going to hear about a new console here at E3? Um, I don't know for a fact. I'm willing to bet a fair chunk of money. We are not going yeah. to hear about a new console. Um, do, I mean, Sterling, do you think that? The gaming market out there is saying, like, I want a new, I need a new console. And let's not include Nintendo in that discussion. <laughs> God, I hope not. I mean, it, it's, I mean, it, I, I don't believe the market wants to spend the money. No. I don't think the businesses want to lose the money. No, I mean, right now we've reached a point. The 360 is about to hit its five-year anniversary later this year. The Wii and the PS3 are hitting their four. It's getting to the point where these machines are just starting to get affordable. Yeah. And I whoever's i i want to know what kind of sickos are hoping to get something else out on the market i'm just hoping my friends can get more than one well, console. people and i'll say this the people who are asking me that are not gamers they are oh, people who just yeah. like kind of oh, like that okay. who, who who just like those sense. headlines i don't know a single gamer that's asking for this i mean no. do you no no not at all i mean as, as sterling pointed out i would love it if my friends had every console so then we could play everything together um, but I, no, I, I don't want one. In fact, actually, that would seem like a hassle at this point. And I'm not really Absolutely. sure what a new console could offer me that my current consoles don't. That, and that's the other thing. We're all, we're, I mean, we're sometimes seeing... you don't know until they tell you. I will say and then outside you go, oh my of, God, I need that. But, outside you know. of an HD Wii. But that's, well, yeah, that's sure. what I said. I want to leave Nintendo out of it because they are going to hit that point much earlier, I think, than Sony and Microsoft, where there's going to be a need to see a little more oomph sure. coming out of their Wii. I, yeah, I don't, I don't think you see Microsoft or Sony do anything until Nintendo makes a move. I think they let them make the first move and then they react to that because they're just, you know, they're in no position to want to do anything but that because I, 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 I want to just take a, this recording of what you just said and send it to me in 2002. <laughs> and I'd be like, what? What yeah. is happening in the future? <laughs> I, I could go for an Xbox that I don't have to send back yearly because <laughs> yeah. 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 Or, or like a smaller one. Zing. I could go with that. Yeah. I would, you know, that smaller, a, yes. a, a new SKU. I, I would not be surprised if Natal came with a smaller Xbox. That would be that would be welcomed. I, th I think so, and I think that if you're trying to stimulate sales, I mean, I can see Natal selling for many people who have 360s. But you know, unless the price comes down dramatically with Natal, which I don't expect it to, you need to find some way of bundling those things together so that it can be appealing to buy all as one thing. And I think a smaller 360. I can't tell you how many times my own mother said back in the old days of the NES and the SNES, oh, but I don't want it around the living room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, it's like, it's going to make all that noise. The blip and the bloop. And my the grandmother bleep. makes the wires. Are those, are those, just are the, those wires. the noises she would say, blip and the bloop? So, one of those I know she did. <laughs> She's going to deny it when I see her for dinner tomorrow. But <laughs> I'll just make sure she doesn't watch this episode. All right, so Robbie Bach, Jay Allen, out of Microsoft. Um, uh, we're now going to do a special breaking Yay, news announcement. 
you. I've never heard that intro to a news. I should have just let you do that. We're doing the like whole thing. Good evening. We are here to announce that due to popular demand and the fact that we wanted to do it, feedback will be on television. Da -da -da! Yeah! Just, just the logo, not yeah, us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, no, a it will not be on. Logo it will not be tape. on TV in perpetuity. But we are going to have two special feedbacks uh, during our E3 coverage. They are going to be on at 9.30 Eastern and 6.30 uh, Pacific, those Tuesdays and Wednesdays of E3. And that would be the 15th and the 16th of June. Um, there will be much chatting. Abby will, will be there. Yep. Patrick Klepek will be there. Yay. We'll be talking about all the big things that will be happening around the E3. And you'll Video hear what, what we think. Um, it should be fun because that will be at the end of a very, two very <laughs> long, very days. long days. And you'll get to see what we look tired. I'm not, not guaranteeing co coherent discussion. And things will just maybe slip out. It <laughs> will be live. This will be live television. So uh, oh, you should make a point of tuning in. Uh, it, it, it should be a lot of fun. Yes. So yep. there you have it. Uh, your demands have been heard, if only mm -hmm. momentarily, but uh, feedback on TV during E3. So you better watch it, you know, to yeah. make it worthwhile. <laughs> no, one, no one's going to show up. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, oh, it's like my uh, 30th birthday party. Uh, <sighs> sorry, there was traffic. <laughs> <laughs> traffic. It was five blocks away. Um, okay. Back to other things involving three. Ah. Kill Zone. Yes. Three. Announced. In I thought that's in, what the drum in, roll was for. In 3D. <laughs> oh, See, okay, I can finally say, I kept on thinking about Killzone 3, because I thought there was a pretty good chance it was going to be coming out. We would be hearing about it. I thought, ah, that 3. That, that 3 could have one little thing right after oh, it. Oh, man. Did you, did you twitch the moment you saw like that it was adding 3D? Um, no, because... <laughs> Uncontrollably spasming in his office. I, I, as, 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 we'll, as we'll be discussing seconds. here, this is not, you can only play it in 3D. Okay. So, you know, that's obviously... Uh, so, anyway, g give us some details on it there, Patrick. So, yeah, I mean, Killzone 3 uh, it's, has jetpacks. It sounds like it's coming out later this year. Um, it's, it, it's not a... You know, I think a lot of people, it's snowy, I guess. There's lots of snow. And there's now a rumor floating around that I read just before we came, actually came down here that uh, they collaborated with Naughty Dog on the graphics technology. Yeah, I, 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 I caught this article as well. Um, I think there's a fair amount of collaboration that happens inside of Sony, so I don't think that sound, should yeah, sound, sound like, like odious. Like, ah, Naughty no. Dog came over and took it over. No, I mean, I think, I think it's, Naughty Dog's actually been pretty explicit that they'll license out their stuff yeah. to anyone. And they have very good snow tech, let's be honest. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Would you not like to see more with snow yes, environments like, yes, like you saw so. in Uncharted? <laughs> um, so, I, I guess I love my Jeep. That is a great... Um, handle whoever I really that is. Comment. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, who, who was it? Was it R. Kelly? You were yeah, me of my, my Jeep. Jeep. That was the, R. Kelly. The single worst video and song of the '90s. I would like to say it was up there. Yeah, it's oof. anyway. Uh, so I love my Jeep. Says to all you folks carrying on about Killzone 3's use of jetpacks, as we just mentioned, and how the game is copying Halo Reach. <laughs> let me fill you in on a few things. Killzone Liberation featured jetpacks, and that game came out in 2006. If you really want to see some old school jetpack action, play Tribes. I guess Killzone and Halo are attempting to revitalize the jetpack. Not too bad of an idea, I suppose. Um, That's what I like to call a burn to the yeah, kids. Yeah, Tribes. <laughs> oh, I'm with you. It's like when I see jetpacks, I think Tribes, and I think that was a really good time a long time ago but you know go go watch thunderball the jetpack it's it's kind of ubiquitous not yeah. not not completely um i mean is there anything specific to these yeah I anxieties mean, we, or not anxieties i mean not not really no i mean when when, when do we even see the jetpack i don't know like in halo reach i can't it was like what six oh, months no, ago yeah well no was and, well there was oh yeah i guess well, it was after that wasn't it yeah i don't know Isn't that's there another the, game with jetpacks too well dark void sure yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. So I guess I guess it's a trend. <laughs> Sorry, <Side> Matt. <laughs> moving on. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> Abby. I put that one in the memory hole to be deleted. Okay. But let's let's talk memory about the 3D hole. because they are touting that this is some really good 3D that they have in the game. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this you know, one of the things that you know I brought up a couple of times is that I don't, I'm not against the idea of 3D. I'm, a, you know, just every implementation I've seen has been, well, let's patch it, let's just throw it on there, and it's. You know, Avatar works at least on a 3D level because at least it was designed for it. You can't fault right. it for that. As opposed to Alice in Wonderland and Clash of the Titans. Where it's all just yeah. thrown on. And, and so it sounds like Killzone, given that it be, could conceivably have a whole year of dev time working on this, may, maybe it will be more interesting. Well, I actually had an interesting conversation at PAX East about um, 3D and, uh, and in shooters. And specifically, we were talking about Battlefield 2 because um, they had a 3D version there. But uh, talking about... 
talking about uh, with one of the game's producers, um, Gordon Van Dyke, about the possibilities for using 3D in games. He was very positive about it. And uh, one of the things that he was saying is is having that perspective. There's a lot of games right now that are coming out that are really showing you like the range on your gun and you know not necessarily being able to snipe someone across the map um, you know with a pistol or like actually making you you do it right. 3D is something that could be put into shooters that would really affect like how that range and targeting that all the visual works. Like, occlusion. Too. Yeah, I mean, I I've because I've thought about it because it seems like a lot of. Um, like shooters were some of the most fun games that I played in 3D, although I haven't been totally sold on the notion of 3D yet. But I think there's a lot of, a lot of possibilities for it. Yeah. So uh, I, I am actually really interested to see what they do, even if that doesn't end up being the final way that I, I play it. I mean, there's, there's there's one reason why I think we can that this could be really cool for Sony and not Sony Computer Entertainment Japan America or Europe. For Sony as a whole, they have 3D TVs. Mm -hmm. They want a good case to be made to have people buy their 3D TVs. You do need a good game, an avatar, to actually give people the incentive like, oh, cool, that's awesome. But only thing is, even if Killzone 3 has the most awesome 3D, I don't think many other yeah, games will, will ever be able to do that. And true. that's going to be, and, and then you have Clash of the Titans and Alice in Wonderland. And will it be good enough to get people away from playing the regular version of Now, the game? that does beg know. the question is it just going to be Killzone? I mean, let's face it, there is a, an 800 pound elephant, gorilla, whatever you want to call it, in the room that everybody's been waiting on on PS3, GT5. That's true. Well, they've they've, 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 they've I, already I confirmed 3D for GT5. They have, oh, they have? It? Yes. They, show, they showed it at that. 3D gaming summit I went to. Did they? Because I'm thinking oh, really? it's got to be yeah. a big showcase. You've got to have that games. That didn't even make a headline. Right. No, it was hidden away somewhere. I didn't even see it. Really? Yeah. So it's yeah they're doing they're doing Gran Turismo in 3D. I think it, I mean it's more uh, at least with like Sony because it's tied into their sort of technology initiative. At least we should get a sort of bevy of games that you know are sort of the case for 3D. And maybe there's enough of one that starts tipping. I mean because it's not going to change overnight. This is going to be like something that happens by next gen, like whenever right. we get around to that. But it could be enough that it tips the scale and says, well, I, I am going to buy a TV in 3D or buy a new TV maybe sometime next year and maybe then I'll get it in 3D because Killzone was kind of cool and it's not that much more. Well, I was just going to ask if the graphics fidelity of GT5 is, uh, is, is, gets worse if you're looking well, see, at it in Well, see, that's the thing with 3D that's is my... it has to render twice. Yeah. So the game has to do what it's already doing that's the thing is, twice. When I, played, when I played shooters in it, like the first thing I noticed is, I mean, one, my perspective is all off, but two, the graphics never look quite as good as... as and then when you're dealing with the speed of a racing game, you do have some added challenge yeah. there because especially yeah. kill zone, you don't move that quickly through those levels. You know, you're no, well, and also, and also, I mean, in shooters, when you're when you're you know taking that kind of even flat perspective, like I'm just looking for movement, and then you're kind of throwing me off by by having this. I don't know. It's it's weird. It's weird, and I'm definitely not as good at playing games. Yeah, movie, I mean, that's which the, might mean which might be the reason I go stay with two. But an interesting point that that you made. Okay, so we got Natal or whatever it's going to be. Ah, wave my hands. Uh, now we always think that move is, uh, you know, that thing that is supposed to be the answer to that. Sure. What if it's the 3D? And you know, like you know, in, in terms of that core gamer market, which of those two is going to resonate more in a post Avatar age? I mean, it's it's it's. I, I just thought of this right now, but yeah, you're right. People are starting to think about that next television purchase that they're going to make, mm -hmm. and I wonder if that's going to sort of draw people towards the PS3, unless Microsoft also reveals 3D, which since it is so popular, I don't think it's an outrageous. Thought. No, it's it's still the money thing, though. Like no matter Very how much. cool Killzone is, you know, when you go and see a, a movie at, at the theater in 3D, it's okay. It's three or four bucks more. That's not you know breaking the bank, but you know buy, buying another you know twelve hundred dollar TV you know is when I can go purchase a regular HD TV for you know four or five hundred. Yeah, you know? I mean those yeah. like it it partially depends on is Sony willing to not charge uh, you know an, a surcharge on their 3D TVs just because they have 3D. And everything I took away from that 3D gaming summit from the tech guys was like, it doesn't cost anything for them to add to the TV. So when they're at oh, just like texting on so your wireless, so when they're when they're, uh -huh. when they're when they're charging you more, just they're like just garnishes doing that on they my can. plate. Yes, that. I, I just I, I don't like garnishes. Those, those restaurants they make you they, they charge you money for that side of cream spinach. It's like come on. Yeah, that happens to me all the cream time. Cream spinach. I uh, like cream spinach. I do too. I think it tastes okay, really good. good okay. uh, I like cream corn. But would you pay extra for it? Yeah, that's yeah, the probably. Point. That's the point. No. Okay, guys. <laughs> That's totally just Abby. We're just gonna I start mean, a foodie blog, like a foodie <laughs> podcast now. I mean, it, I'm it's, totally okay with that. If if you asked me like a month ago, when I thought the economy was improving, I think I think the I think the 3D TV thing might actually happen at the end of the year. But now, 
I looked at the paper this morning and like, it was like, ah, like everything's falling apart. Like the euro may not exist in like, yeah. you know, two months. So, I mean, yeah, this I, I think there's a lot of intentions that we're expecting a, a, a contemporary climate that may not actually be there. Towards well, the I, end just, of the year. I think it's v- very difficult, especially for Sony to even demonstrate why, like, why is Killzone 2 or Killzone 3 so cool in 3D? You have to go experience it. And it's not as simple as yeah, just going somewhere, you know, going to the movie theater. It, which, that's why Natal has the advantage of, you know, it's very easy to demonstrate what you do with this thing. And even with Move, to a certain extent, at least you know, you know, you have the Because Wii of the idea. Wii. But I still think that almost like motion control and 3D, it's like, yeah, you're going to have a harder time reaching your market to convince them that that's kind of awesome. Yeah, I mean, how do you show consumers? I mean, we've thought about it and putting together E3 coverage. Oh, my God, if they show things in 3D, what? Yeah. What do we do? Yeah, they'll have to take Send our word for it. I'm yeah. like, oh my God, it's full of stuff. Well, as long as you can watch Adam wearing 3D glasses, watching that's, the 3D. That's pretty much the same that's, experience. Yeah, yeah. then you know. <laughs> um, quick one, uh, one of the final ones, uh, our, our final news piece. Uh, yet another game is being made into a movie by Legendary Pictures. Yes. Mass Effect is uh, actually, I mean, it was, it was, it was picked up by, uh, I'm going to mess up his name, but uh, Ari Arad, the guy who yes. used to be the head of uh, Marvel. Marvel Studios. It's, it's since spun off to uh, just have uh, Ari Arad Productions, where he essentially has picked up, I mean, he's done some other stuff, but by and large, mostly just picked up video games yeah. since. He is, he's the one that originally picked up Mass Effect uh, from EA and Bioware, and, but now he's actually, you know, gone in collaboration with Legendary Pictures, which is a production company that has a, a, a phenomenal track record. I mean, you know, the, Dark Man, being, the Dark Knight, yeah. Batman Begins, 300. And they currently Superman. have, uh, they, they have Gears of War, but that seems to have stalled in production. But this uh, is another. They're, they're doing World of Warcraft. Okay, yeah, so that's right. Oh, they, he's also got Uncharted. Well, Ar- Ari does, but I mean, Legendary oh, Predictor does, is, yeah. is, is, doing, is doing World of Warcraft with Sam Raimi. So, Remember I mean, when it used to be just Yuva Bowl that made I know, <laughs> man. I, yeah. I miss those days. Oh, those were the days. Or the right? Mario Brothers movie. He doesn't mm-hmm. email me And there was a Mario anymore. Brothers porn with Ron Jeremy. I yeah, that doesn't that. surprise me. This. Yeah, there's, there's, there's probably been adventure porn from the old 2600 game. But really? I'm just I'm going to Google that after, yeah. after the please show. Please do, please do, and let Breaking me know what you find. News. Um, here's one of the things I like. Blue. I'm assuming, 07, uh, says, I might be reading too much into this, but the statement's a compelling backstory, which leads me to believe that the film won't be about Shepard, but about the humans' first contact with the council races in the Turian War. I think this is great news, actually. I do, too. Yeah. I think you can do the best with a video game by not doing the story as was it was told inside of the Especially video game. Especially a story yeah. where the story changes based on what you do in the game. And, yeah. Another very, very good point, because if they saved the, if they did the story of the first Mass Effect and they saved the council, I'm like, ah! Maybe it's a choose-your-own-adventure. I can, you know, I can sit in the seat and like they'll come up with the choices and the Shh. audience can pick. Maybe a producer. <laughs> I mean, even like I, don't, I don't want to see Commander Shepard just because I don't want to see somebody else's idea of Commander Shepard. Yeah, sure. I have true. my very own personal and Commander Shepard. Films are very good at doing that big, epic Lord of the Rings type thing. The backstory of like man suddenly finding Mass Effect and realizing there's all these aliens out there, I think would be far more effectively told in a movie than it could in a video game. Because it's not about a person. It's about, you know, people. Yeah. And I think what's really cool about this one specifically is that the Bioware doctors, you know, Greg and Ray, are on board as executive producers. Now, that probably means they have very little material impact on what happens other than just getting a name credit up on the big screen. But it is cool to see, like, those, yeah. those guys from the outset, you know, maybe have some involvement. And, and yeah, like, definitely. Hopefully they'll trot them out to help push the movie because they make convincing cases for, I mean, they could sell me on soil if they, you know, if they actually put their minds to it. I'm Thank gonna, God they do I'm, it on video I'm games. Go- I'm going to see if I can make that happen. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Patrick. News, 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 news. How many, how many little musical sound effects are you going to make this episode? Yeah, really, this is the musical <laughs> episode of, of feedback. It's, it's, just, it's just ambient sound. It's probably from all that Red Dead. It's like, you know, like, you know. <laughs> is that the cougar attacking? Yeah, that's the cougar attacking me. Uh, we're going to talk about a couple of games uh, for Game of the Week. Uh, the first, uh, Patrick, you reviewed it, uh, Prince of Persia. The Forgotten Sands. Yes. Now, is this closer to movie or is this closer to that original Ubisoft Prince of Persia franchise? I mean, no, this is this is uh, essentially the, the best way to de- I would describe it is uh, Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time in HD without the heart and soul of Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time. It's it's a competently done uh, a game with a lot of highs and lows. It's got the parts you do like about Prince of Persia, but again, it just doesn't. The story is terrible and throwaway. Uh, the combat may as well not be there. Um, and the platforming is there, but by the time you strip out the combat and the the not so fun parts of the platforming, 
uh, you, you know, you're left like a couple hours that you'd rather spend probably playing a much better platformer like Super Mario Galaxy. Yes, but what do you think about it? I don't know. <laughs> I haven't thought. I haven't thought about it. It's, but that's the thing. I, I, and you know, it was interesting playing this game in that uh, I, you know, and Sterling will have my back in this. I was, I adored the the Prince of Persia reboot from 2008. Likewise. Uh, I, I loved that game's middle finger to the game over screen. I, it was a flawed game, but I, I, I no, thought it was. Fine. I thought it was a very. That's okay. Oh, what? I didn't like it. I, I didn't what? like it either. Like it. I'm sorry. I know you don't. I know you don't. <sighs> So 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 I thought you know I'm gonna go sit on his side. You <laughs> yeah, you gotta move over there. You just go. Over let's, there. Just start, let's, the... let's just start talking yeah, about yeah, Resident that was Evil Five. Fire. Cracking That's my it. knuckles. <laughs> um, but the, the one question I have is, given the problems you you have with the game, those sound like the problems you would have with a movie tie-in game. I mean, it, they it, seem it, to have made an effort not to make a movie tie-in game. It, it feels, feel, you know, to its credit, it doesn't, you know, there's no, you know, Jake Gyllenhaal character that you're running around with. It's the same voice actor. It's the same sort of setting. It's just. It feels like a game that we're like, oh, okay, so we finally have a date from Disney for this movie. All right, let's 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 get a Prince of Persia game, a production that's based on Sands of Time. It just doesn't. Nothing about it feels inspired. Everything from the special mechanics to the uh, to the upgrade system, where you really have no choice, it's just an illusion of choice. It just feels very forced, and that the team, the, the moments where the game does work. It, it strikes me as a team that did the best with what they could, and they had a very small dev cycle mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. there are some moments that are absolutely brilliant and Good. super fun. And the ending sequence, which is this crazy sandstorm, is by far one of the most uh, exciting things I've experienced in, ever in a video game. Wow. And it's just tucked away at the very end. And so that's why like, there's so many things that I didn't like about the game, but a lot of things that I did like. If you were a big Prince of Persia fan, you should play it. It's, it's fun. It has enough fun moments that it is absolutely worth playing, but... Given the fact that you know something like Mario Galaxy is coming out at the same time, would I even this, this was would I, would I recommend it at all compared to that? Like absolutely not. And it was unfortunate timing because this had to have been dictated by the movie's release rather than you know sure. exactly. This is, yeah. this is a good time for absolutely. it. Absolutely, I referred to it. I was thinking of as uh, Prince of Persia: The Forgotten Achievements. Yeah, because in six months, I'm not going to remember playing it. I played it for about two hours last night, and it was kind of like. It's you're, per- you're, you're I said, a third of the way there, so you might as well yeah, just keep going. I, I referred to it. I was saying earlier this morning. I said it's like Purgatory on a disc. It's not really Ooh. off. It's not hellish. It's certainly not heavenly. It's just there. Well, isn't that like what Lost turned out to be? Or something like that? I hey, never watched do really, Lost. Do you really want to go down know. that path? No. No, not, no, not the quality <laughs> of the show. Like, no, no, I'm enjoying my moratorium. No more Lost. Yeah. I don't have to hear about it. Well, um, and, and what was the score? Three out of five. Three out which, of five. Which is, right. you know, right there with, it's, it's worth playing as a Prince of Persia fan, but there's a lot, there's, you know, if you haven't played, you know, even what was the third? Don't let this be your introduction to the franchise no. by all means. No. What was the, what was the third uh, Two Sands Thrones. of Time game? Two Thrones was not yep. great, but right. it was be- it was better than this. Go if you haven't played those, go back and play that those. Was the M rated one that was like, Ooh. no, that, that was the was good M rated one. That was yeah. Warrior Within. Yeah, that was the grungy. Oh, Godsmack you're one. right. You're right. You're Two right. Two Thrones was the the one after that. Okay, let's talk about mm-hmm. that other game that came out, Split Second. This has been the racing game. All of us been like, ah. Yep. This is so pretty. It looks so cool. It's like a kart racer, but it's not. I've alternately gone on, ah, at the same time with it. This is the, the podcast with This is Onomatopoeia, <laughs> it's your gaming art. podcast. Next week, we're just going to grunt <laughs> noise cast. <laughs> <laughs> well, it'll be Adam's interpretation of the Wild West and, and Red Dead just for 45 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> <laughs> what did I sign up for? <laughs> Hold on. I'm the wind. All right. <laughs> yeah, we'll just give him <laughs> animals in the world. Armadillo. <laughs> 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 what? I don't know. That was an armadillo. Okay. Armadillo. I haven't, I haven't made it to Mexico yet, so I don't know what they sound like in the game. I apologize Surely to Disney not. Interactive. Wow. I apologize to armadillos. Yes. Split second. Um, Split second. So, I mean, at the end of the day, is it kind of a new uh, way of approaching the kart racer? No, actually, it's not really the kart racer, per se. I think Blur took on a lot more okay. of that. This one's more of an action racer. It's... It's been compared to Burnout a lot, mm-hmm. and after yeah. playing a lot of it, I don't know that that's a necessarily fair comparison. It's a lot. I mean, it has el- those elements. There's very much this uh, this mean <laughs> streak of whoever got you, screw them back later on, and that's a lot of the strategy to the game. But I don't think it's as physical, so to speak, as Burnout. It's not like when you're in the middle of a race and somebody's bumping you. You just you know you want to get payback. You just hit them in the back. They smack into a guardrail and you take them down. And there's no real like afterburner effect that allows you to get a huge boost. It's a lot more dependent on uh, mechanics. It kind of reminds me a little bit of Ridge Racer. Okay. It's a, it kind of, in a way, kind of reminds me of Ridge Racer, except you can screw people over once they pass you. Because you can, what the idea is, 
Uh, the story is in a reality show set, and it's a ginormous set where you can destroy elements of the set to like kind of deform the terrain and create new paths for yourself, and also to collapse large objects on your opponents. So your attacks, as they were, is not so much the turtle shell <laughs> or a gun, it's you're actually deforming the environment. Yeah, so you trigger, you basically like trigger a giant silo that explodes and knocks everybody out ahead of you, and you just pass them. Now, blowing Mario shit Kart or yep. terrorism. Now, are you, <laughs> is, is, is this done through pickups that are on the track? I mean, how are you allowed the ability to do this? So what happens is if you perform certain tricks, like if you drift effectively, or if you are, um, it uses kind of, they drafting. call it drafting, yeah. but it's like slipstreaming. That's what made me think of Ridge Racer, <clears> because <throat> Ridge Racer 7 introduced this idea of slipstreams where you get behind a car, and because of the resistance, you can get an edge on them. And if you keep drafting other cars, that's how you build your power-ups. Now you can do like simple power-ups, or you if you build up all three, you can do like a mega power-up that like effectively nukes everything, gives you another path, and bones everybody else who's behind you. Yeah. So, is it fun? Yes. Yeah, it's so okay. much fun. It's okay. fun. <laughs> Boom. It's so very, much fun. It's very fun. My only caveats about it are, um, and the not-so-happy grunting, there's a lot of rubber banding AI, and it's, yeah. there's parts where it's just plain cruel. Okay, the fact that rubber banding AI in racing games still exists, I mean, is this just essential to keeping a game fun? I don't think, you know. So how does it change that online then well, where you wouldn't have it's, 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 okay, I, That's yeah, where I, can... I feel like it levels out the playing field a little yeah. more online from what I had played. Um, I felt like, okay, now if I lost, it's legitimately because of this. It's not because I went from first, I drifted into a corner, and then all of a sudden five cars just passed me and I lost. I had way more fun playing by myself. And I, I see what you mean about the rubber banding AI, but at the same time, like the first uh, like tier of races where I took first and everything was like the second to last one. I mean, because I I had like done it before them, but I think I had the hang of it. And then I went online because I was all excited, and I got my butt handed to me. I don't play <laughs> racing games a lot, so I was really excited when I beat Split Second because I think it's the first racing game I've beaten in a long time. And also, I had like finished and won in the season spot. And then I went online, and everybody destroyed wow. me because it's a lot wow. harder online to hit people with the um, with the destructive triggers. Yeah, the power and plays. Uh, I had a couple times where my car got turned around the other way, and there's not really a reverse, so I was just stuck, and then I was turned around, and then it was way too late to catch up, even with the stuff that I could build up to knock them out. It's way harder to hit people with it, so boo for me for the online, and I again, that might be a, I'm not that great at racing games, but I love the single player. It's a great game. I, actually, I found online I had an easier time using the drafting system because there was a lot of yeah. okay, well, if I do this, and then my strategy became I need to weave around like a like I'm you know. Totally buzzed or something. I don't want working. people drafting behind me. So I'm yeah. like, move to the left. No, no, no. Screw that. Move to the right. And there was a lot of that going on. So I'm not good at drifting, so I was just all drafting. That was my main focus but, throughout the entire But, you know, thing. the one grievance I do have with the online is that you have to really, like, play through a lot of the game before you can get on. It kind of reminds me a bit of Street Fighter 4, where you had to beat the game as so many characters. You, you to do, unlock a you bunch unlock of characters. You have to play through so much of that game in single player before you can take cars online. Because if you decide, oh, I'm just going to jump on, you're going to get smoked. If Completely some guy has smoked. the fastest think, car in the game and is really good, you're, that's it. But I mean, do you think they, they kind of held you back from going online because they had this new style of gameplay and they wanted to at least try to weed out people who just, you know, jumped online and have no idea how to play it and just kind of screwed up a match? I don't know exactly what the design decision was behind it. I don't know that it was about trying to get you enough experience before you hopped online. It just seems kind of inexplicable. And, um, you know, that's, I mean, those are the rubber banding, that. Um, the idea of this having to unlock cars and probably I would say also um, the fact that the stages tend to repeat themselves and mm -hmm. by the time you get to about the three quarter point of the game you kind of go wait a minute I've seen this before. Yeah, You're just giving yeah. me another race on the same course. That gets, another a, little, race that gets style. a little repetitive, but what they do, that, which is so awesome, and, and I think one of the reasons that I enjoyed the game so much is because not every race is a standard race. A lot of them, like, you're trying to avoid, like, the barrels coming off the back of a truck. You're trying to avoid helicopter fire and then, you know, destroy him back. So it's like, it's not just straight racing. Some you just have to go through and they blow up everything in the environment as you're going through and you just basically have to avoid it. And uh, to have, like, such varying degrees of, like, not mini games, but like mini races, like that was really fun for me because if I think if I had to play through the entire game as just straight races every time, I would not have enjoyed it so much. Is there a variety of changes like the multiplayer too? Or is that just straight racing? There's a, you, you can, can do, do a couple of Yeah, you can do a couple ones. of them. So the barrel one, which is also, as she's saying, it's a lot of fun. The idea is you are driving behind this massive 18-wheeler, and it's dropping barrels off the back of the truck. If you hit the blue ones, they kind of slow you down, they stagger you, and if you hit a red one, it's instant death. That so awesome. and you get, like, so, retry. Yeah, so you've totally got to like dip and weave in between these barrels, and that's fantastic. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just curious, Abby conceded to not being, you know, kind of a big racing game aficionado. Where do you fall in terms of, you know, love, affection for racing games? I really like arcade style racers, so I'm not much of a Gran Turismo or Forza okay. guy, but if you give me What like, Split Second is, is kind of like under it, your purview. It, it reminds me very much, it's like there's a lot of elements of Burnout, there's a lot of elements of Ridge Racer in, in there, and... Um, it, it, overall, if you're looking for like a fun arcade racer, I don't think you can go wrong with this one. Yeah. And what, what was your score? I give it a four. All right. So thank you, Sterling. Thank you, Klepek. Um, let's get to a viewer question. Uh, Zach One Morris asks, can each of you tell us about one up-and-coming development studio we should keep an eye out for and why? They can be new or old, big or small, develop for any platform and be located in any country in the world. Should have thought about this oh, one before. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but well, Hal Bart had a really big one here. We're going to have to ask his question next week. Um, actually, I'm, I'm going to say one, and Abby's going to agree with me. And I'm thinking now because it's easy to think of smaller studios. I actually know what you're going to say. I think. What am I going to say? Twisted Pixel. Yes, Twisted Pixel. These are the guys that did yes. the Maw. It went from the Maw to Explosion, man. Massive change in terms of game design and, I think, in game complexity. And then we just saw what they're doing with Comic Jumper, which... Slightly really? similar, maybe, to Explosion cool. Man, but far more, like far greater breadth in terms of what they're doing with the game. These guys have creativity. And I, I guess the question I'm going to throw out there and just use Zach Ron Morris as a sounding board is we're seeing a lot of these very creative small studios that are doing Braid. They're doing stuff like that. Can they transition into like more proper retail games? And let's, let's, let's throw in Chair Entertainment doing Shadow Complex. You mean, I mean like ha- having these small studios make bigger games? Yeah, is, is this? I, I I don't want to do them any disservice by saying this, but sure. Let's 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 call it the minor leagues oh, because right, they're right, doing right. DLC. Can they? You know, are are they doing the right thing that they're going to start to you know replace the Insomniacs, replace you know the 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 Infinity War somewhere down the line? I, I think that falls more to just consumers catching up. Like the more the more in, internet integration comes into consoles, and that's expected something you do, and that the more people start to strip away having sort of physical media. I think that, I think they're just ahead of the game. I think they're like five years ahead of where, like, but those guys are going to be so far ahead of everyone else when they start getting to that arena and already knowing how you, you know, and you're seeing this a lot of companies where they sort of the smaller experiences on the disc and then you expand out from there based on uh, user reaction. So I think, I think that's, I, I think they're just, they've already laid the groundwork and if they stay there, they'll be fine. They just need to stick it out for a while. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, I was wondering <laughs> if you were going to like talk about any other. Studios well, are, are, any are other... there any studios that come to your mind, Abby? <clears throat> well, you took. Oh, sorry, I had the thing. You uh, you took mine because uh, I knew that you were going to say that, and, uh-huh. then, and you took it. So give me a second, and uh, well, know, maybe our 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 friends with the shooting games. Oh yeah, um, I. Oh yeah. That's true because um, Breach is coming out um, this summer, and that's kind of seems like to be a, a smaller piece of of. Six Days in Fallujah, or at least what they had, you know, or at least what built the, the foundation is. for in yeah. the tech. Um, I think I think that's a really interesting one to watch for right now. I think um, I think they have some stuff to overcome in terms of uh, just trying to establish yourself as a new shooter that kind of is touching on the same things that other shooters are doing, but they offer something yeah. really new. I'm looking forward to what they see. Um, the last time that I saw the game, it's a little. It has some frame rate issues that I think they're going to resolve before it comes out, but it was so much fun to play. I, I think Breach has an, an advantage in being a downloadable game because, A, you know, it'll be cheaper, and, B, there's just less competition there. There's just really aren't downloadable well, first-person shooters. And cross fingers, this will come sometime in the summertime, which, right. you know, obviously, it gets the jump to those yeah. major shooters at before, the end of the before year. Before Halo, which but, we now yeah. know is coming in September, <laughs> and before Call of Duty, which you know is right. November. But the, the one problem they do run into, and this is what downloadable stuff needs to figure out, is that... The marketing downloadable games is very difficult, yeah. and if and if you if you we saw this happen with Castle Crashers, even if a game is very beloved, if you screw up the first week or that launch day, it's very difficult to recover. Yeah. From. I mean, I mean, and, and 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 this is true on the iPhone and, Every, and things like that. Everywhere, I mean, everywhere, this is the digital is, space that's so challenging and concerning to me. Yeah, and unless you know, it's it's one thing with an MO where it's sort of expected, but for these other games, you know, if and Breach is a much more complicated game because it's going to be an online shooter that needs to be balanced and stuff like that. They do run the danger if they if they you know fudge it up day one that have you already completely lost your audience? Oh, yeah, your and it's an, mouth issue, is gone? it's an issue of money. I mean, you you don't doubt that you know if a game comes out and there's something wrong with it that if it comes from a larger publisher and it's a giant game that they are going to have to fix that at some point. But with something smaller, um, I, you know whether they have the money to to implement the changes that they need to do. I mean, uh, I don't know. It could probably, I, I think that's probably why uh, you know in the first week if you don't hit it, you're 
Right. I'm screwed. I think a lot of it comes. From I would money. like. I would like to see a resolution to that problem, and a lot of it comes from the platforms that they're you know made available on, and so hopefully because I think it is a very viable space that just needs mm-hmm. to be nurtured instead of making it so, you know, it's 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 very very capitalistic. You know, Adam Smith would be proud of the way things mm-hmm. are marketed and succeed out in that digital space. Um, Sterling, is, are there any studios that stand out to you? Um, you know, it's interesting that you guys are saying that. Um. It may not be like I don't consider them up and coming, and I guess that's kind of loaded. <laughs> but it's not a blockbuster studio per se. But um, right now, I feel like Ninja Theory is one to watch. Okay. Um, last week, I went and checked out Enslaved Journey to the West, which is the game. This is the team that did Heavenly Sword, and this is only their second game. It's their first cross-platform game. But um, what they're doing with like motion capture and the expressiveness of facial animation and their art design, you know. I don't know that it's going to be necessarily like AAA blockbuster title, but like right now, as I'm seeing it, I'm very, very intrigued by what they've got. Their art direction is something that I think stands really makes them stand apart because it does not look like anything else that's out there. No, from what I've seen, I mean, like I love. Have I talked to you guys about this at all? Have you heard about? I think Patrick's I, I, overheard I, yeah, me. Yeah, I've seen, seen a little bit. I mean, it's, it's, it. it seems like the student, they, they're going to benefit a lot from not having the platform pressure that they had last time to uh, dealing with Heavenly like Sword. they do with Heavenly Sword. Yeah, but I mean, like, the idea is it's kind of this post-apocalypse, but, like, nature has moved on. So instead of your browns and grays and your Fallout or Gears-style kind of apocalypse, it's very green and lush and colorful, and color really plays into it. One of the things they showed me, one of the abilities in combat, it, it's like a an upgrade where you can detect, like, if an enemy's attacking you or if they're prone just based solely on, like, how what color they're shining. So if they're coming at you and they're red, they're kind of have a reddish hue, you know you have to block and you counter when it's kind of gold. And it's just really cool what they're doing with color. It's very visually appealing. And I know Andy Circus, who's yes. gonna yeah. is heavily, heavily involved in like animation motion captures, cool. very much on board. As he was with, with Heavenly, Heavenly Sword. Sword. Exactly. He was the best part of that game too. Yeah. I'm like right now I'm hoping it's gonna hold up when I get it in my hands at E three, but for now that's kind of one of my like sleepers to watch for later yeah, this there's year. There's a couple I mean, I I wouldn't call it a sleep again, there's like some that I'm like, Oh, I wouldn't call them sleepers because they've obviously had some some hits Experience. or decent big hits, but like I've, this has been very exciting. I'm very excited about Vanquish and Platinum Games and what yeah. they're doing because I have yet to be disappointed by them. They have a lot so of creativity. Yeah, they yes, have they a do. lot of creativity. There's one that I'm I'm super digging. And um, man, when are we when are we gonna see that horror game? Where's that horror game? Mikami's horror game. Um, the one, one the one he's working with Suda. Oh, that's right. That was part of one of the first EA partners that's right. announcements. That's right. Uh, I haven't seen that game. I know yeah, somebody's probably Mikami. watching who knows Suda. I'm just saying. Yeah, cough up some details. Know, is Make it something happen. is it still happening? <laughs> that's 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 the question I have. Um, Patrick, is is there any studio that stands out in your mind that you know you would? You know, I toss a nod to one of the one of the games. Uh, uh, if you haven't seen it, it it's gotten a, a decent amount of press. But that I can't remember the the, the, the studio off the top of my head. But they're making the game Fez, which is this pixel based. Oh, Xbox, Polytron. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Fez and God, I wish I had written down the other one. Uh, but Fez, yeah, Polytron, and yeah. like. And it, what's really cool is seeing these guys. Microsoft's pretty smart about this, and Sony is quickly catching up. But just seeing these companies being able to co- sort of pluck these guys from like the GDC indie finalists, mm-hmm. where they don't have a platform yet, but they've got clearly a game that could be ready to go in about a year of polish. And Fez, you know, which is this weird flip on the two D, three D, where you're you're playing along a two D plane, but then can sort of rotate the world in order to interact in three D. And they're just stuff like that just gets me really excited. And, and Microsoft has done a really cool job of picking up sort of some of the, the cool elite stuff of yeah, that so stuff is, and getting uh, them. So is Nintendo, actually. Some of the stuff that I've seen for, for WiiWare has been really interesting. Yeah. No, one, no one plays it. But it that's what, and, <laughs> and, okay, but I, it's not that that um, PlayStation and, and Microsoft, it's not that they don't have the same problem. Sure. Because um, look at PB Winterbottom. Yeah. I mean, yeah. No that, one played that game. No one played that game. That game. And, so good. and you have the yeah, backing of 2K on it. And, yeah. and, and again, it's like, there. so there you have that vehicle to kind of market it out. And where, where was It's interesting. We, we have filled up a space without understanding that space. Yeah. And, 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 and I don't that, think anyone does. Stuff. I mean, that's why you see, you know, that's why it's cool seeing like EA partners again get behind games like Death Spank coming from Ron Gilbert. And I think what, what I've seen on the iPhone and, and, and the iPad is that the publishers are needed to elevate it to that level yeah. to, to, to what we're talking about, to getting on a level of a retail yeah. game because indies can't do it on their own. 
but not even publishers know how to do that yeah. yet. It's so, and again, it comes to money people? and marketing and and and, the and rest how do you it. market a digital yeah. game? Like it's not just like go to GameStop. And it's not just by most popular or viewer ratings. No, because some of this stuff needs a little bit of extra love to get under the right eyes. And and I'm I'm, I'm adamant about that one. I was the the, the other small thing I was going to say is that having done uh, the the speech at SMU, the Guildhall. Um, I was just shocked at the level of talent that I saw from all of those kids there and that, like, I do get excited about that space because, like, these, these, these kids made this hour-long 2.5D platformer using the Unreal, like, 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 the UDK, not Unreal Engine 3. And that's like, okay, if that level of talent is out there just trying to get, you know, through school, then, yeah, I, I, I think we all stand to, uh, uh, to, to benefit further down the line. And that's also a pitch to go see that Sessler Soapbox where I did, did the speech. It's 20 minutes of my life. I want to share it with people. So go check it out. Um, with that, I would like to thank Sterling, Abby, and Patrick for joining us. Yay. Thanks. We'll be back here next week. Uh, maybe we'll talk about Activision more, but you know what? Hey, Hopefully no gar- not. No guarantees. Hopefully not. Everything will just be quiet from here all the way to E3. Yeah, um, I'm sure that's what will happen. Yeah. Remember, <laughs> yeah. Things are really quiet from here to Live E3. Live on television, Tuesday and Wednesday of E3. That is June 15th and 16th. Make sure you check it out. But we'll be here next week in this studio. I'm a badger. Uh, owner Jam. Hello there. I'm Adam Sessler, host of X-Play, editor-in-chief at G4TV.com. I talk a lot about video games, and sometimes a camera is in front of me when I'm doing that. We call that Sessler Soapbox. It takes about two minutes of your time, but trust me, you will hear invective and joy, and probably a lot of rude things like you've never heard before in the context of video games. I do it for you, so you should check it out. It's up every Tuesday on G4TV.com.